Oh, so today we'll be discussing some important uh, questions about the anatomy for part one. We do have almost 200 slides today, so we need to run quickly, okay? So I'm not going to discuss all the slides for only the important ones. But if you have any questions, you know, you know, I'm glad to uh, answer anything in the uh, uh, chat of the Telegram. Okay, so question number one. So the level of the umbilicus varies in obese women. What reference point can be used instead? So what reference point can you use instead of using the umbilicus, especially in obese women? Do you know anything about that? Quickly guys, please. The, which is the level of the anterior superior iliac spine. No, I guess no. So, subcostal plane. So, next question. I'll explain that in a minute. So, next question. Which vessels can possibly be injured in the subcutaneous tissue where the transverse suprapubic skin insertion is made? Which vessel can be injured during the transverse suprapubic skin insertion? Any clue, guys? Any clue? A, B, inferior, inferior gastric. No, no. We're talking about the subcutaneous tissue. Subcutaneous, not uh, you know below the muscles. Superficial epigastric. Yeah, I guess this is correct. Good. Very good. Which structure blocks the blood supply to a loop of small intestine at the femoral ring, causing strangulated femoral hernia? So we're talking about the femoral hernia, okay? So what kind of structure would block the blood supply? In the ligament? No, think again. Try again, please. Quickly, guys. No, it's the lack in the ligament. So it's B. Okay, next question. So now, Today we'll be talking about the first topic would be the anatomy of the anterior abdominal wall, okay? So when you're studying this part, the first of all, the regions, which was the first question. Okay, the regions, as we all know, right have the chondrium, epigastric, left have chondrium, okay? Right lumbar, umbilical, left lumbar, right inguinal, hypogastric, and left inguinal, okay? We do have two uh, sublines. We have two transverse or axial sections and two sagittal sections. The two sagittals are the metacarotidal lines, and the two horizontal. The first, the, the, the one is the subcostal plane. The first one is subcostal plane. You know, which it, you know runs below the subcostal region, uh, below the tenth. Uh, tenth vertebrae. Just need the other. Yeah, the tenth costal cartilage, L two. Okay, tenth costal cartilage. We also have the transtubular plane, which runs between the two tuberosities uh, of the uh, iliac crest. So where is the transpyloric plane? So we now we're finished. We're done with the. Uh, Subcostal plane, we're done with the transtypical plane. And so, where's the transpilotic plane? This is the transpilotic plane, which runs at the level of the 10th costal cartilage, right here. So, it's a little bit above the subcostal plane. So, transpiloric 
it's called like this because it turns through the, the pylorus of the stomach, okay? That's why it's called the transpylorus plane at the 10th costal cartilage, but the subcostal plane at the level of the 10th costal cartilage, okay? So we can use the subcostal plane instead of the umbilicus. As you can see from this picture, it runs directly through the umbilicus. The umbilicus will be right here. So, you know, in case of obese ladies, okay, the umbilicus will be, you know, um, redundant uh, down there. It's not being in the same place, in the usual place. So if we need to identify where the umbilicus is, umbilicus is we can use the subcostal plane instead. Is that clear? Okay, so subcostal plane can be used as a marker of the umbilicus, not the transpyloric. Good. So when you're studying the abdomen, we have three main regions. The first layers, layers of the abdominal wall above and below the, the above and below the arcade line, something called the arcade line. I'll show you what I mean in a minute the inguinal canal and the femoral triangle. So three things in the abdomen, the wall, inguinal canal, femoral triangle, okay? First, the wall. So what are the layers of the abdomen? From superficial to, you know, down in there, we have the skin, we do have the superficial fascia, the superficial fascia layer and deep membranous layer. So superficial fascia, composed of two layers, superficial fatty layer and deep membranous one. The superficial fatty layer is called, do you know, do you know what, what is it called? It does have a name, by the way. It does have a name, by the way. Compass. And the other one, Dr. Hassan, perfect Dr. Hassan. The other one, the deep, the deep membranous one. Do you know what is it called? Compass. Good, perfect. Perfect. So we, do, we don't have a deep fascia in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the abdomen, okay? No deep fascia uh, to allow, you know, uh, more easy respiration, okay? We do have the, uh, the rectus sheath, the anterior rectus sheath, then the rectus muscles, then the posterior rectus sheath, and, you know, uh, interior to that, we do have the, something called the fascia transversalis, which is unique to the abdomen. And we have the exoperitoneal pads and the peritoneum. In this picture, hang on, yeah. But well, first, we need to identify what the arcade line is. So you can see this is the arcade line. What is it? So this horizontal line demarcates the lower limits of the posterior layer of the rectus sheath. So the sheath has two layers. Sheath, you know, has two layers, the anterior sheath and posterior sheath. The sheath is composed of the three upper neurosis of the three muscles of the abdomen, the, inter the in um, internal oblique, external oblique, and transversal abdominal muscles, okay? they converge together, then at the level of the rectus abdominis, they uh, divide, the upper neurons or the sheath divides into anterior and posterior sheath, as you can see from this picture, to anterior and posterior, okay? This happens in the upper two thirds of the, of the abdomen. Down there in the lower one third, fibers from the posterior sheath you know, past anterior. So in the lower third, there is no, there is no posterior to sheath. And as a result of that, okay, as a result of that, of this passage from the posterior sheath, the anterior sheath, the arcade line forms like this. So it's the posterior free border of the posterior to sheath. Okay, this is the arcade line. So in the previous picture, in this one, okay, as you go up in the uh, upper what two-thirds of the abdomen, there is anterior to sheath and posterior to sheath. Okay, 
in the lower one third in the way in, in the place that we do caesarean section the finishing incision there is no posterior sheath there is anterior sheath then the muscles then the fascia transverse cells and peritoneum of the cavity okay so the arc line is the lower free border of the posterior sheath okay clear guys it is clear Hey guys, please, please let me know. Good. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. So next. So another question. Superficial inguinal ring is strengthened posteriorly by which of the following structure? So this question is examining your understanding of the inguinal canal and its uh you know support for many many parts what kind of structure would you know give more power to the inguinal inguinal canal you know posteriorly conjoint tendon perfect yeah this is correct answer i'll show you a very nice uh, diagram of the inguinal canal in a minute just bear with me so which of the following nerves pierces the internal oblique muscle and pass it through the inguinal canal? So we need a nerve that pierces the internal oblique muscle so, and pass it through the inguinal canal. The ilioinguinal nerve, perfect, good, perfect. Another one in women, the inguinal canal transmits the ground ligament to the labia major. Yeah, we all we all know that. Which nerve also transverses tra traverses the inguinal canal exists by superficial inguinal ring? So, which nerve will pass through the inguinal canal and exits? via the superficial inguinal ring. Which one? You know, basically the same thing. It's any inguinal nerve. Same thing. Yeah, perfect. The uh, genital femoral nerve, it's not here, but it doesn't it doesn't pass through this, the uh, the uh, the ring. You know, it passes, but it doesn't, it doesn't pass through the superficial inguinal ring. You know, in the middle of the canal, the ilio inguinal, the uh, genital, genital, genital femoral nerve, Traverse at the middle of the canal to the femur. Okay, so anatomy of the inguinal canal. Okay, this is very important. You just need to know the basics of that. So the canal is a defect in the in the wall of the abdomen. Okay, so it's a tunnel. Tunnel made through the all the walls of the abdomen that we just said. Okay. The, the sheath, the muscles, the fascia transverse cells, and even the peritoneum. Okay, so a canal does have an, a beginning and an end. So it starts at the deep ring, you know, the defect here, all the way to the exit, the, the superficial ring. Okay, so it defects in the fascia transverse cells, in the upper neurosis, the, in the sheath, in the muscles. All the way to the anterior to sheath till the exit. Okay, so since it's defecting, so this is a weak part of the abdomen and it's defecting the abdomen. So we need to reinforce the floor and the anterior wall, the anterior and posterior. We need to make some enforcements in order to compensate for this defect. Yeah, clear. So this is a very nice diagram, by the way. This one is much better than the previous one. Because, uh, you know, if you do this one, you, you will answer the question in the exam. Okay, this is a cross section, cross section in the um, the inguinal canal. Okay, this is the inguinal canal. As you can see, this is anteriorly. This is posteriorly. As you can see from inner side to outside, side, you have the peritoneum. You do have here the transversalis fascia and both of the muscles. And we have the external oblique muscles, and 
the wall of the abdomen okay and down there there's the first the first uh the first uh reinforcement thickening of the floor of the canal thickening of the floor of the canal will form the inguinal ligament there should be a ligament here okay so the inguinal ligament is thickening of the floor of the inguinal canal okay so protect the canal from below okay the aponeurosis of the extended oblique is the major component of the anterior wall so this is the extended oblique it will form the major component the major structure that enforce the anterior wall of the canal okay fibers of the internal oblique muscles reinforce blood support the posterior wall of the canal okay uh reinforced by the conjoint tendon like here so you can see from this picture so this is the canal as you can see anteriorly fibers from the external oblique aponeurosis okay posteriorly this is the posterior part of the canal okay this is the reinforcement by the internal oblique muscle and the transversus abdominis monti uh, converge together to form the conjoint tendon. This is the conjoint tendon. It's two layers, by the way. Conjoint tendon. Laterally will be the internal oblique muscle. And can you see this nerve? Can you see this nerve that passes between the transverse abdominis muscle and the internal oblique? This one would pierce it through the internal oblique to pass through the inguinal canal. Which one is this? Which one of this guys? Do you see this nerve? Hello, oh, can you hear me? Can you see this nerve? Hello, perfect, Dr. Hassan. Alien going on nerve. Good. Good. So we're done with this. Okay, lastly, we need to. Okay, thank you. Contents, importance. What are the contents of the inguinal canal in females? But well, first we have the round ligaments. So do you know what are the attachments to the round ligament? Where, where does it go? Where does it go? The round ligament. This is a question for you, by the way. Yeah, where does it go? Please share it with me. No, 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 no. Yes, it has some conjoint tendon is made of two layers of the muscles, the internal oblique, the internal oblique muscle and transversus abdominis. Yeah, perfect. So tell me that has some place, what are the attachment of the round ligament? Where does it go? Where does it go? Labia major, perfect. Labia major, not the mons pubis. Labia major. So also we do have the iliangular nerve T12 L1. We do have the genital branch, genital branch of the genital femoral nerve. Genital branch of the genital femoral nerve, L1 and 2. It's important for you to know the nerve roots of the nerves because it does come in the exam frequently. Okay. Just hang on. Sorry guys, no, bullet trains. So genital branch, genital femoral nerve, L1, L2, obliterated process of vaginalis. What is that? This is the, I told you, the canal is made of uh, all layers of the abdomen, all the way to the peritoneum. So there's a little bit process of the peritoneum, you know, a peritoneal fold, a sac of the peritoneum that pass through the inguinal canal. From the deep ring all the way to the external ring it's obliterated you know it doesn't have anything at all you know it's a potential space but on such a condition it might you know it might be filled with the fluid to form the uh something called hydrocele of the canal of nook okay so this process of vagina was thin this part of the peritoneum that passed through the inguinal canal is called the canal of nook 
the canal of knock. Okay. When it's filled with a fluid, okay, it, it will become hydrocele of the canal of knock. You know, simple. It might lead to vulgar swelling, vaginal swelling, femoral swelling, something like that, because it passes, you know, it pass along with the pass along with the inguinal, with the ingon, with the uh, I mean with the uh, round ligament of the uterus. Okay. Clear guys. So don't forget about that. So we have a ligament, a process, and two nerves. Okay. Should pass from here to there. Okay. But you know, this way, but uh, this is the, the male uh, diagram. Okay. So, but you know, basically the inguinal canal, the content, the reinforcement, basically the same. Or the only difference in the content. Good. So, femoral canal, which is also important, you know, you need to know the borders and the content of the femoral, I mean, the femoral triangle. So, femoral triangle, femoral triangle, the borders, sail, S A I L, from the lateral to medial. Okay, sail from the lateral to medial. What's, what is sail? Sail is laterally sartorius muscles so sartorius this one okay medially abductus longus this one and superiorly will be the inguinal ligament il inguinal ligament so those are the the, the borders of the inguinal of the sorry the uh, the the femoral femoral triangle okay sartorius laterally abductus longus medially inguinal ligament in the base. So a sail from lateral to medial. Okay. The apex also would be the the, uh, the meeting of those together, the adductus longus and the uh, sartorius. So don't forget about sail. Okay. Sail from lateral to medial. So what about the content? Navel. Sail and navel. N-A-V-A and L. Navel. Again, from lateral to medial. So I'm just trying to make it easy for you. Okay. So what is navel? What are the navel a component? Nerve, artery, vein, and empty space, which be the femoral uh, canal. Okay, be right there, it's potential space, and L for lymph nodes. Femoral nerve, femoral artery, femoral vein, femoral canal, the empty potential space. This is that's the E, the navel, and lymphatics, some lymphatics. Okay, so we have sail and navel from lateral to medial, sartorius, abductus longus, inguinal ligament, and nerve, artery, vein, empty space, and lymphatics, lateral to medial as well. Okay, uh, so this is a construction in the femoral uh, region. This is the inguinal ligament, this one. Those are the muscles, and those are the content of femoral, of the femoral um, canal. Okay, we have the nerve, artery, uh, and vein. Okay, and this yellow one here, don't 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 miss it up. Okay, this is the femoral canal. Okay, and this orange one. Can you see this one? So this one would come straight. You know the femoral, the femoral hernia will pass through the canal right here okay femoral hernia will pass all the way from the peritoneum to the femoral canal and you can see lacrimal ligament is the one that would make would you know make so much compression on the on the uh, on the hernia will strangulate the blood vessels you know one of the surgical procedures that the surgeon would do in order to relieve the strangulation would cut cut through this lacrimal ligament Okay, to relieve the obstruction of the blood vessels. Okay, so don't forget about this lacrimal ligament. But this one is the femoral canal. It's a close proximity, close proximity of the femoral canal. That's clear, guys. Am I, am I going too fast for you, or or this is you know appropriate? This picture. Uh, shows you the uh, you know the pathway 
the pathway of the femoral canal. This is the sacrofemoral hernia, this one here, in the most medial part. So, so the novel MAV, empty space, and also the lymphatics is not shown here. Okay, this is the sac of the femoral hernia. This is the inguinal ligament right there. Okay, and this one is this is the inguinal region, by the way. So okay, and this one is the inguinal hernia, the direct inguinal, the indirect inguinal hernia, right there. Okay, important. Say that mother, don't ever forget about it. Dermatomes of the abdomen, important. So all you need to do is you, you, you're not you're not gonna you know you're not going to uh, memorize every part of that. Just know that around T10, which is the level of the spinal epidural anesthesia, uh, it's T10, the umbilicus, umbilicus T10. And the finished seat incision will be T12 or T T11 T12. The iliohypogastric ili, ili hypogastric nerves. Okay. Suprapubic L1. Suprapubic will be L1. Okay. So we have T12 umbilicus, a little bit below, you know, at the level of uh, transverse abdominal incision, the finished T and joint kind and other things will be T T12 and T11, T11, T12. Suprapubic directly or be L1, okay? So T12, T10 around the umbilicus, yes. Oh, you don't have to, you know, uh, know about this. this. This is the basic anatomy of the pathway of the nerves from the uh, roots, we have the ventral rimae, the dorsal rimae, okay, we have the, sorry, the uh, roots, then the rimae, then the nerve, then the branches, all the way to the, the wall of the abdomen. We have the, the uh, uh, ventral root and dorsal root. We have the ventral root and we have the dorsal root, okay. Then we have the anterior rimae and posterior rimae. The posterior rimae will pass through, pass all the way to the posterior component of the wall. You know, it doesn't have anything to do with the abdomen, in the trunk, posteriorly. Anterior rimae, okay, will go through the layers of the muscles to supply the skin and the muscles of the anterior abdominal wall, anteriorly and laterally as well. Okay, there's so much details for the part one, but you know, feel free to read about it. Vessels of the anterior abdominal wall, important and very, very important, okay? So, so list of vessels. What are the vessels of the anterior abdominal wall? We're talking about the wall, not inside the pelvis, not inside the abdomen. Okay, so the vessels, as you know, uh, will be superficially. And also we have some deep vessels in the wall. Okay, the deep vessels will be the inferior the gastric and deep circumflex iliac. Okay, inferior the gastric and deep circumflex iliac artery. Okay, do you know those arteries are branches of which artery in our body will give rise to those deep branches of the wall? Hello, which artery in our body will give rise to the deep arteries of the wall? Uh, could you answer me, guys, please? Could you please share your answer in the chat box? Hello. Okay. External iliac artery. 
the external iliac artery will give the deep branches of the wall, the inferior the gastric and deep circumflex iliac. We also have superficial vessels that run, uh, you know, superficial to the muscles. Okay, so deep branches due to the muscles, superficial branches, superficial to the muscles of the wall. Okay, we have superficial epigastric and superficial circumflex iliac. Those one would run, you know, just below the skin. Okay, those kind, those kind of arteries that you can cut through during the skin incision, okay? Superficial epigastric, superficial circumflex iliac artery. Do you know what, what kind of artery, which artery in our body will give rise to those, those superficial branches? Which one? So we said that external iliac artery uh, will give rise to, gives rise to the deep branches. Which artery gives rise to the superficial branches? On guys, please. The perfect is the continuation of the external iliac artery, which is, which is, which is continuation of the external iliac artery, which is. Which is called. Please write in the chat box, please. Important for you to answer this question. What is the continuation of the external iliac artery? Summerall, perfect. So we have the external iliac artery like this, okay? And we have the wall, wall of the abdomen. Right there, down there would be the inguinal ligament, okay? The external iliac artery will give some branches deep to the muscle. Once it passes, below the the wall of the abdomen becomes the femoral artery and gives rise to the superficial branches okay so deep superficial external iliac and femoral external iliac gives rise to the deep branches the inferior the gastric and deep circumflex iliac on um, those kind of arteries okay those arteries have sister arteries, have sister superficial arteries. The sister arteries would be superficial epigastric and superficial circumflex iliac artery, or branches from the femoral artery. Okay, good. Next. So those are the deep vessels, branches of, just need my laser points again. Yeah, branches of the external iliac artery. Branches of the external iliac artery. This is the external iliac artery. This is the deep circumflex iliac. And this one is the inferior epigastric. Okay. And yeah, important here, very important here for the anatomy of the wall and the anatomy of the laparoscopy as well to know about the, the course of the inferior epigastric. So as you can see, it pierces through the transversalis fascia right there as you can see and passes superficial to the arcuate line can you see this arcuate line you know this picture is from inside not from outside okay so this picture is from inside this is the anterior wall the anterior abdominal wall from inside okay and this is the inferior epigastric. this is the external iliac artery and that's the vein okay and this one is the deep circumflex iliac artery. And this is the inferior epigastric artery. Pierce it through the transversalis fascia. Okay. And it passes just, you know, along the surface of the uh, rectus muscle. Then it jumps between the muscle and the arcuate line. This is the arcuate line, which is the inferior free border of the posterior tachy. Okay. Then it continue, you know, superiorly or, or in the kefala direction to anastomose with the superior epigastric, not the superficial epigastric, but with the superior epigastric artery, which is a branch of. Do you know? Do you know? Do you know anything about 
Do you know anything about the superior epigastric artery? Could you please tell me any information about the superior epigastric artery, like a branch of form? It's a branch of the, the interior and in, um, the memory artery, the internal memory artery, which is a branch of the second part of the subclavian artery. So the other way around, second part of the subclavian artery gives rise to the internal memory artery. The internal memory artery runs through the chest all the way down to the abdomen to anastomose with the inferior, with its sister, the inferior gastric artery. Clear, guys? This is the pathway, pathway of the inferior gastric. Especially this part is very important. The relation between the inferior epigastric artery and the arcuate line. Okay. Next. Yeah, this is a very important part. You know, you know, it comes in the exam frequently. Laparoscopic consideration for the anatomy. Okay. Safe zone. Safe zone. Okay. Uh, to put in in the trochus. This should be from less than one centimeter from the midline or more than eight centimeters from the midline. So can you see this picture? We have some gray color. We have some, you know, light green and dark green. This light green, you know, is very dangerous. Should be, it should be colored in red, by the way. This is the course of the inferior gastric, this light green thing. This is the course of inferior gastric. As you can see, there's variation, variation of the course of the inferior gastric. Well, uh, in the middle of the tummy, in the middle of the abdomen, it comes close to the midline. As you can see, so to be safe, to be safe to uh, put in your trochus, because, you know, injuring the inferior gastric is, is a nightmare, a nightmare to the, uh, a nightmare to the uh, laparoscopy. Okay, so you need to be either one centimeter from the midline here. You would be uh, medial to the inferior gastric or eight centimeters away from the midline. There's dark green parts of the abdomen. Okay, and right here you'll be lesser to the inferior gastric course. You'll be, you know, good to go. Okay. So one centimeter, less than one centimeter or more than eight centimeters. This is the way you could button your trochus. Okay, without any fear from uh, injuring the inferior of the gastric artery. Okay, clear guys. Good. As a back triangle, another important part of the anterior abdominal wall. Okay. What if it has a back triangle? Well, it has a back triangle, but you know. So it's a triangle, you know, in the interior part of the anterior abdominal wall. So again, this is the anterior abdominal wall and from inside, from inside, anterior abdominal wall from inside. This is the rex muscle. This is the inguinal ligament, okay? And those are the, the vessels, the external oblique. Uh, so this is the artery to the lateral and vein to the medial. Okay. And this is the femoral canal. This one, the femoral canal right here. Okay. And this one is, you know, what is this artery? This one. In the chat box, please, guys, could you please tell me a branch from the external iliac artery that passes, you know, here to the rectus. Which one is this? Inferior epigastric artery, perfect. So the triangle between from inside of the anterior abdominal wall, okay? Triangle between inferior epigastric and lateral border of the rectus muscle and the base would be the inguinal ligament. This green part would be the uh, inferior epigastric. Okay. 
it's important because this is a site for di direct inguinal hernia. So we have two types of hernias, inguinal hernia. We have the direct and indirect. The indirect will pass through the inguinal, the inguinal uh, canal, okay? But the direct will pass directly through the anterior abdominal wall, okay? Good. So, so don't forget about it. Inferior the gastric, lateral border of the rectus, and the inguinal ligament. Um, this is the laparoscopic view of the Hasselblad's range. Okay. This one, the inferior gastric artery, you know, it's a little bit difficult for you. Um, this one, the uterus, as you can see the uterus. You, you, can you see the uterus? Okay. And what's this? What is this structure that passes between the uterus and the inguinal region? What's this? Could you, could you tell me, please? What's this structure? Quickly, guys, please. Easy, round ligament. So what is this point? The point, yeah, round ligament. So what is this point? The point where the round ligament will vanish through the abdominal wall. To enter the, which part is this? This is the side up. Tell me in the chat box, please, guys, quickly. What is this point? Deep ring, perfect, Dr. Samuel, perfect. So this is the deep inguinal ring. So I can imagine that the round ligament, the, the, the inguinal ligament will pass through here. So this is the inferior gastric, and this is the inguinal ligament right there. And this is the lateral border of the, uh, the muscle, the rectus. So this part here, this part here is the hustle box triangle. This part, good, thank you. So the median umbilical ligament is embryological remnant of both feet structure. So what is the medial, median, median umbilical ligament? What's the median umbilical ligament? Rackus, perfect. D, Rackus, perfect. Thank you, guys. So we have three types of umbilical ligaments. You know, we have the median, the medial, and lateral. This one in the middle, called the median, which is obliterated uracus. Okay, and we have the medial. This one, obliterated umbilical arteries. Obliterated umbilical arteries. Umbilical artery is a branch of. Do you know the umbilical artery is a branch of which which artery? Which artery gives rise to which artery gives rise to the umbilical artery? Which artery gives rise to the umbilical artery? Which artery gives rise to the umbilical artery? Perfect. Anterior division of the internal iliac. Perfect. The obliterated umbilical artery is the medial umbilical ligament right there. And laterally, the condensation, the lateral umbilical ligament is the condensation around the inferior epigastric. So we can imagine that the medial umbilical ligament lies inside the Hasselbach triangle. Yeah? Good. So the deep subcomplex iliac artery is a branch of which artery? Deep subcomplex, deep subcomplex iliac artery is a branch of which artery? C. Yeah, perfect. External iliac artery. You know, I should have you know I should have done these questions a little bit early, but you know, not important. If a woman sustains an ischemic injury to the pelvic ureter, which artery supplying it has been occluded? You know, this is a tricky question, but you don't have to answer it now because, you know, this is a question from the college. 
and I'll explain in a bit the about the arterial supply of diuretic because it's not, you know, diuretic doesn't have a single blood supply. So according to the segments, upper third, middle third, or lower third. I'll explain that to you in just a minute. This question is deficient, by the way, lacking some information. So which artery is a direct branch of the aorta? Easy. Which artery is a direct branch of the aorta? C, ovarian. Ovarian artery, perfect. Inferior vesicle, branch of the internal iliac. Uh, so is the uterine artery and the renal artery. All those arteries are branches of the internal iliac. Ovarian artery is a direct branch of the abdominal aorta. Okay, perfect. So talking about the vessels of the purpose. So we're done with the vessels of the wall. Now we need to dig in deep and you know talk about the vessels of the pelvis. So, overview of the vessels. This would be uh, the aorta gives rise to the uh, divides into the external of the external iliac artery and the internal iliac artery. Okay, and so does the vein. Internal iliac artery, two branches, two divisions. Anterior division, this one, and posterior division. Okay, the anterior division of the internal iliac, you know, shortly, you know, so, so the internal iliac itself is very short, it's like about three to four centimeters, this little part here, okay? For soon after that, it divides into two divisions, the anterior division and posterior division. Anterior division gives rise to many, 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 many arteries, the uterine artery, Obturator artery. This one, this, this little one here is the obturator artery, the one that passes through the obturator canal, obturator foramen. This one. Okay. Also gives rise to the umbilical artery. This one. This one, umbilical artery. Okay, which is obliterated. As you can see from the rest of the artery, it's obliterated and gives, we form later on, the medial umbilical ligament. This one also gives rise to superior vesicle artery, vaginal artery, uterine artery, this one, uterine artery, and inferior gluteal artery, this one, inferior gluteal artery. And the terminal branch, the last branch it gives is the, no, it's not, um, wow, this is a mistake. The terminal branch, is the internal pudendal artery, this one. So this is the one of the most important branches of the internal iliac artery, the internal pudendal artery. It leaves the pelvis, okay, through uh, the, this is the ESPL spine. So it hinges, make a curve, makes a curve around the ESPL spine leaves the pelvis and enters the perineum. This little part here is the perineum. So the door of the perineum is the canal around the ischia spine. Okay, this is the door to, to the perineum. Okay, internal pudendal artery is the main arterial supply, the main arterial supply to the perineum. So those are the branches of the internal in, uh, anterior division of the internal iliac artery. The trick one is the inferior gluteal artery. So inferior gluteal artery comes from the anterior division. In the posterior division, we have so many arteries as well, just three arteries, superior gluteal, lateral sacral, iliac lumbar arteries. So superior gluteal, this one here, exits the uh, pelvis all the way to the gluteal region, superior gluteal artery. This is the largest branch of the common iliac and largest branch of the posterior division, the, the superior gluteal artery. As you can see from this picture, 
you know, this muscle here is called the piriformis muscle, okay? So the piriformis muscle leaves the pelvis through the greater sciatic nodes to the greater circumference the of the femur, okay? Above that muscle, above this muscle, you know, there is the superior gluteal, and though this muscle is the inferior gluteal artery. What I'm telling you now is an exam question, okay? I'll be like this. Which artery leaves the pelvis and passes above the piriformis muscle? Or which artery, the artery that leaves the pelvis below the piriformis is a branch of which one? Anterior division or posterior division? So you need to know all this information. So the inferior gluteal artery is a branch of the anterior division of the internal iliac and exits the pelvis below the piriformis muscle. Why the superior gluteal artery is a branch of the posterior division, leaves the pelvis uh, and passes above the piriformis muscle. Just clear, guys. Just got here to add the internal pudendal artery. This one. Should be written here. Okay. Good. The schematic view of the old arches of the pelvis. Okay. So same as before. Corner mortis. What's corner mortis? You know, from the name, something very dangerous. I mean, it's the killer. Okay. Corner mortis. Corner means the crown, and mortis means something that's gravid something that might kill the patient, okay? For mortality, it's anastomosis between two things. Anastomosis between the inferior epigastric and the obturator artery. So basically, we are talking about a pathway for the blood between the external iliac artery and the internal iliac artery. So sometimes in cases of severe postpartum hemorrhage, okay, as a last resort after hysterectomy. So you might, you know, think think of you know ligating the internal iliac artery right there. But sometimes even after doing that, there will be some blood. Still hemorrhage occurs. Still there will be blood in the pelvis. This blood comes from anastomosis from the external iliac artery. This anastomosis is called the chronomortis. Okay, so the short shortcut between the external iliac and internal iliac artery. Okay, guys, is that clear? Okay, please tell me so that I can go on. Good, thank you. So, large is the branch of the internal iliac artery overall superior gluteal. Okay, you know, it makes a lot of sense because superior gluteal artery is the main arterial supply of the gluteal region. So supply of gluteus maximus, medius, and minimus. Those are the main abductors of the thigh. Okay, so the fleshy big muscles that need a lot of blood supply. Okay, superior gluteal artery. So the largest branch of the posterior division, the largest branch of the internal iliac uh, at all, okay? Large is the branch of the anterior division, obturator artery. Again, why the obturator artery? Because the obturator artery, obturator artery, this one, passed through the obturator canal to supply the anterior medial part of the thigh. The uh, vastus medialis thing and those kind of muscles, again, those are the main flexors of the head and knee. Uh, extensive of the knee, flexor of the head, uh, so we need so much blood supply in order to supply these big fleshy muscles. Okay, good. Artery supply of the uterus and vagina. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry, pardon me. So uterine artery is a branch of the anterior division of the uh, internal iliac artery, but just above the ureter in the vertan canal. I'll show you the vertan canal in a second. 
So this is the uterine artery, right there. And this is the ureter. You know, left one, right one, left one. Okay. So this is the right artery. So it gives ascending branch, cervical branch. Sorry, gives ascending branch to the to the uterus, rest of the uterus, and the tubes. Also gives descending branch to the cervical region and descending a branch to, to supply the vagina. So we have so the vagina has many arteries, okay? Descending branch of the uterine artery and the vaginal artery itself, which is a separate branch for the vagina, comes from the anterior division of the internal iliac artery, okay? Okay, so the vagina branch of the uterine artery, this one anastomos with the vagina branch of the internal iliac artery. As I told you, this one, this is the vagina branch of the internal iliac artery, and this one is this little one here, is the descending vagina branch of the uterine artery. This one. So the do anastomos together. So in the middle, so the key branching, key branching till they meet in the middle. So branches from the uterine and from the vaginal artery, also some branches from the internal peritoneal artery, the main supply of the uh, perineum from the left side and right side, they merge in the middle of the vagina to form a single pool, as we might call it. This single pool artery is called the asgus artery, the vaginal asgus artery. So the, all of those arteries meet in the middle to form the, to create the azagous artery of the vagina. Yeah. Okay. Anteriorly and posteriorly. So it might be a question that I ask you. So during abdominal hysterectomy, okay. So you done with the uterus, you remove the uterus, you removed the surface because this is a total, a total abdominal hysterectomy, and now you're left with the vagina the stump. And this bleeding in the stump, and that bleeding, this bleeding comes from the middle of the stump. This is an exam question. I'm going to ask you, since this is the middle of the stump, okay, which artery is the responsible for this bleeding? Could you please tell me? Which kind, which, which part would you like me to repeat, Dr. Hassan, please? Which part, which part has the artery? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sanya. So, Dr. Hassan, please tell me in the chat box which corona mortis. Okay, so are you done with this, with the Azagas artery? Are you happy with this? Are you happy with the Azagas artery? So, you, you'd like me to repeat the Azagas artery? On the corner mortis. Okay, so again, corner mortis. Again, so go back, back. So this is the corner mortis. Anastomosis between the external iliac and the internal iliac through a branch uh, that connects the obturator artery to the inferior gastric. You know that inferior gastric artery is a branch of the external iliac and the obturator is a branch of the anterior division of the internal iliac artery. There'll be a small branch here, a small artery here, a connection, a shunt, okay, uh, between those arteries, the obturator artery and inferior gastric artery. So we made a connection between the external iliac artery and the internal iliac artery. Tell me. Okay, guys, so no, no. okay, so can you answer this question in the chat box, guys, please? Dr. Nada uh, has you know has put you some questions in the chat box.
really a lot for you. So you can do it in a recording. Okay, so which of the following arteries may occasionally arise as a branch of the external iliac artery or inferior gastric artery instead of a branch of the internal iliac artery? Which of the following arteries may occasionally arise as a branch of the external iliac artery or inferior obturator artery? Okay, so waiting for Dr. Mella to tell us. Is this correct, Dr. Mella? Good. Obturator art. Okay. So, Dr. Hassan, are you done with? Are you done with? Excellent, guys. Are you done with the Asgas artery? We need to move, guys. We have a lot to, to cover today. So, course of the ureter. Course of the ureter. Important as well. Yeah. So, at the pelvic brim, you know, the course of the ureter is very complex. You know why it's complex? Because it changes direction. Yeah, I mentioned in the case of hysterectomy about, uh, I was talking about the Asgas artery. So if you see blood coming from the, uh, for, from the stump of the vagina after removing the uterus and the cervix, and you look to the stump, okay? So there's blood coming out there, and this blood comes from the middle of the stump. It's got to be the Asgas artery, because the Asgas artery of the vagina, you know, located in the middle, in the center of the vagina, okay? So any block from the middle of the vagina has got to be the got to be the Asgas artery. Okay. Okay. You're welcome. So So, course, course of the ureter at the pelvic brim. You know, course of the ureter is complex because the ureter changes direction three times with the ovarian or the gonadal uh, arteries. So, at the pelvic brim, the course is just equal to the internal iliac bifurcation, medial to the ovarian vessels. This is the pelvic brim. This part of the pelvic brim, this is the aorta. This is the external, this is the common iliac external iliac artery and internal iliac artery. This is the obturator artery, this one. Okay, so where's the ureter? This is the ureter. Um, those are the ovarian ligaments, the artery and vein. So, in the uh, at the pelvic brim, it passes just equal to the, inter the iliac bifurcation. This is the iliac bifurcation, external and internal, okay? Just a little bit above this bifurcation in the language of the anatomy, we call it the kephala to the bifurcation. It just crosses in there, okay? At that point, it will be medial to the bifurcation, but, uh, sorry, medial to, medial to the ovarian artery medial to the ovarian artery. So if you're dissecting to the posterior abdominal wall and if you could see the bifurcation, okay? So from lateral to medial, the bifurcation ovarian arteries, then the, the ureter, okay? Bifurcation, ovarian artery, the ureter. Bifurcation, ovarian artery, the ureter, okay? So at the level of the bifurcation, the ureter will be the most medial part. Will be the most medial part. I mean, the, the most major structure. Okay, don't forget about it. At the level of the bifurcation of the internal and external, okay, uh, the ureter lies in the most medial structure. Yeah, important, very important. So the whole course of the ureter started right there, okay? The ureter started from 
the renal pelvis, okay, right there, just, you know, superficial to the source muscle, okay, passes medial to the internal iliac where it's crossed by the ovarian vessels, okay? So everything is okay until it meets the ovarian vessels. Those are the ovarian vessels, as you can see here, the ovarian vessels take the long way, okay? From center of the body all the way to the lateral of the body, okay? They cross the ovarian artery at the level of the ischial uh, tuprosity, the, the iliac tuprosity, the iliac crest right there, okay? At that point, ovarian artery will be lateral to the, the ureter, ureter, ureter will be the medial part, okay? Then the ureter will cross kefala to the bifurcation, Okay, and as I told you, at that point, at the bifurcation from lateral to medial bifurcation, ovarian vessels and the ureter. Okay, is this clear, guys? Because I, I need you, I need to make a point here. Is this clear? This is important. Can you see? Can you locate in this picture a very important? difference between the left side of the body and right side of the body. Can you see the venous supply, the venous drainage of the ovary in the, la the left side on the right side? Do you not notice anything in the left side and on the right side? What's the difference between the venous drainage of the ovary in the left side and, and right side? Tell me, please. The uh, blue are colors of the veins. So do you notice any difference between the left side of the body and right side of the body uh, for the drainage of the ovary? Quickly, guys, please, it's, it's obvious. Right side, yeah, perfect. So right side was for drain all the way to the inferior vena cava, left side drains to left renal vein. Perfect. Left renal vein. Good. Thank you. Okay, so vertime canal. So course of the ureter in the vertime canal. It pass so this is the ureter as you can see. Um, this is the uterine artery. Okay, this is the internal iliac artery, and this is the uterine artery. This is the ureter. Okay, and this is the uh, uterine artery in the tunnel. This little one here. This is the cardinal ligament. This is a pre zoomed picture, you know, deep inside the pelvis. And this, this ligament here is the lateral ligament of the uterus, the cardinal ligament. This is the cardinal ligament of the uterus. Okay, so this cardinal ligament is the roof. Of the vertime canal. On the vertime canal, inside the canal, pass, uh, pass the ureter as well as the uterine artery. Yeah. Okay. So the ureter is the most inferior structure of the canal, and just above it would be the ureter, is the uterine artery. Okay. This is called the, the vertime canal. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Not supply of biota. Segmental. What what do I mean by segmental? Means it depends on where is where. Okay, so the upper third of the ureter, which is close to the kidney, okay, the closest to the kidney, will receive some supply directly from the renal arteries. The middle part of the the middle part of the ureters. So Water under the bridge, yes, perfect. Water under the bridge is the ureter, you know, passing down, passing down. Uh, this is the first time, yeah, this is very good, Dr. Hassan. Thank you so much. Water under the bridge means the ureter passing below the uh, roof of the first time canal. Perfect. So, plus supply of the ureter, segmental, upper third, middle third, and lower third. Upper, upper third. You know, receive some blood supply from the renal vein, renal arteries. Okay, the middle part from the common iliac arteries, 
from the abdominal aorta and the gonadal arteries from the ovarian artery. The most distal part of it, according to the college answers, received the flow supply from branches of the inferior vascular artery. So this is the question. If there is ischemic injury to the ureter, okay, which artery did you injure? Which artery did you occlude? Which artery did you occlude? This is typically happens during the uh, laparoscopic hysterectomy or abdominal hysterectomy when you play with the area down there in the pelvis, okay? So sometimes you might include some important branches of the, of the ureter, okay? Uh, like including the inferior vertical artery, okay? Including this artery might lead to uh, ischemia of the lower one third of the pelvis, okay? Inferior vesicular artery. Okay, thank you. So the blood supply of the ureter depends on you know the segment of the ureter. Is it upper one third, middle one third, or lower one third? Okay. So, so question: What artery supplies the distal third of the transverse colon? Distal one third of the transverse colon. Inferior mesenteric artery. Perfect. Good. Yes. Inferior mesenteric artery. This is schematic V of the blood supply of part of the intestine as well as the rectum. What I need you to do here in this one, please focus on the rectum. Rectum has three blood supplies. Okay. So, upper two third and lower one third, upper two third, some, something called superior rectal artery. What is the superior rectal artery? Superior rectal artery is a branch of the inferior mesenteric artery. So as you can see, this is the portal circulation, okay? This is the splenic artery, as you can see, and this is the uh, Inferior mesenteric artery, superior mesenteric, mesenteric artery, something else is not shown here. So this is the inferior mesenteric artery, it gives rise to uh, some branches to supply the distal one third of the transverse colon, sigmoid colon, and it gives this little branch here, this little branch here, as you can see, this is the, the superior rectal artery, this one. You see this one, this is the superior rectal artery. Also, we have other branch that's supplying the rectum, this one here. Do you know what is this one? Do you know what that one is? This one in the middle. In the middle, this is the middle uh, rectal artery. This is the middle rectal artery. Okay, which is a branch of? Do you know the middle rectal artery? The branch of which one? The middle rectal artery, guys. The branch of which one? Which artery in the body gives rise to the middle rectal artery? We just studied it a couple of minutes ago. Which artery in the body gives rise to the middle rectal artery? Perfect. Anterior division of the internal iliac artery so that's why it's not shown here okay last one is called the inferior rectal vessels or inferior artery which is the branch of the internal pedental as you can see it's below it's you know below the, the diaphragm so the main arterial supply of the perineum okay the internal pedental artery which is again a branch of the internal iliac artery the anterior division so internal pedental artery gives rise to the inferior rectal artery. This one here. So we have three rectal arteries, superior, middle, inferior. Superior, the branch of the inferior mesenteric. Middle, internal iliac. Inferior rectal artery from the internal pedental artery. So we have anastomosis between the portal circulation here because you know the venous drainage would go the same way. Venous drainage of the upper third of the rectum 
will pass to the inferior mesenteric vein. Okay. Uh, so this is the portal circulation, a portal circulation. By the way, this picture, guys, is not for the arteries. This is the picture with the veins. So this is the, but, but you know, it doesn't make any difference. You know, just we need to clear the concept that we have three rectal muscles. So this is the inferior superior rectal vein, which is a part of the portal circulation, as you can see here. So pass to the portal, to the portal um, vein, okay? Anastasia knows where the middle rectal vein and inferior rectal vein. So this part of portal systemic anastomosis, which is, you know, a site for uh, dilatation in case of portal hypertension and biasm, so and so. Okay, it is clear, guys. Tell me, is it, is it clear or not? Shall I continue? Thank you, Dr. Hassan. So question, 18 year old woman who had inflammation of the right ovary complains of painful spasm and the muscles or some numbness on the skin on the medial part of the thigh. The following nerves is mostly involved. What kind of nerve, you know, that got something to do with inflammation of ovary with the salpingeal arthritis? The obturator nerve, perfect, because it passes. So we're just talking about here the content of the uh, ovarian fossa. Perfect. Which nerve or nerves flexors provide a sensory innervation to the cervix? So we know that the cervix is, you know, sensitive. There is sensation to the cervix. So which nerve would transmit sensation from the cervix all the way to the spinal cord? Which part? Pelvic splanchnic nerve, perfect. S2, 3, and 4. Pelvic splanchnic nerve, perfect. Pelvic splanchnic nerve, no, not the not superior epigastric process, no. Okay, so which nerve arises from the ventral rimae of the lumbar plexus emerges from the medial border of the cellus major muscle? So a nerve that comes out of the lumbar plexus emerges from the medial border of the psoas major muscle and this nerve is very important for the gynecology team i'll tell you why in a second okay so which nerve of those is a branch of the lumbar plexus and has important relations to the psoas muscle no Come on, guys. Obturator nerve has nothing to do with the psoas muscle. Obturator nerve in the sacrum. It's in the sacrum. In the sacral region. You know, it's the obturator canal, obturator form. Yeah, perfect, Dr. Hassan. Thank you so much. It's the genital genital femoral nerve. Genital femoral nerve. Good. Good. So inferior hypogastric plexus is an important plexus supplying the hind gut. Yeah, the hind gut. So the distal one third of the uh, transverse and sigmoid all the way down to the rectum and the canal. Sympathetic components are derived from the superior hypogastric plexus. What are the three nerve roots origins of the parasympathetic component of this one, the parasympathetic component of the uh, hypogastric plexus. I just told you a couple of minutes ago, I told you what are the, the roots of the parasympathetic uh, supply to the pelvis. The 
perfect to sign it. S2, 3, and 4. Perfect. Consultant and a test is teaching junior and a test. Okay. Uh, how to administer a spinal anesthesia, okay, for CCA instruction. At what level the spinal cord, the spine does the spinal cord end and the coda equina begins? So basically, this question is asking about the basic thing the anatomy. At what level the spinal cord ends? At which level of those the spinal cord ends? I guess, yeah, correct. L1, L2. L1, L2. So between L1, L2, the spinal cord uh, will end and the code when it begins. Okay, perfect. So here we need to talk about overview about uh, overview about the nerve supply of the pelvis. Okay, because this is very important. Okay, the nerve supply, you have autonomic supply to the pelvis because the pelvis has many organs. We have the bladder, we have rectum, we have intestine, we have uterus, tubes, ovaries. We have a lot of things that need, uh, that need autonomic nerve supply. Also, we have muscles, we have sphincters, we have uh, pelvic floor muscles. So we need also stomatic sensation, okay, through the pedendal nerve and the coccygeal nerve, okay. So overview of the nerve supply to the pelvis. Sympathetic, the first one. Sympathetic pathway. Any pathway in the body has two main things: efferent and afferent. Efferent means supply from the center to, to the organ itself. And afferent, the return thing from the organs all the way to the center of the body, okay? So efferent means supply, afferent means returning back, okay? So efferent, sympathetic pathway, efferent. Lower two lumpus planconic nerve, L3 and L4 this one and that one l3 and l4 okay all the way to the superior hypogastric process all the way to the superior hypogastric process okay where is it this is the superior hypogastric process okay. I'm really sorry about this, guys. So L3, L4, pass through. Can you see this red line there? Okay, those red lines. So yeah, come from here. L3, L4, now pass, pass all the way to form plexus. This is the superior hypogastric plexus, this one. Okay, then this plexus divides into right and left. Inferior hypogastric plexus. So superior hypogastric plexus, then inferior hypogastric plexus, which is the main station of autonomic supply to the pelvis because it has sympathetic supply and parasympathetic supply. Okay. And this plexus, okay, will give sympathetic supply to the whole pelvis. Okay. To the hope we do have sympathetic supply everywhere in the body up to the root of the nails up to the big toe up to the root of the hair and the head everywhere in the body we have sympathetic and parasympathetic supply so what's the main hub we call it the hub 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 of sympathetic supply in the pelvis it's the hypogastric plexus gives rise to the inferior hypogastric plexus 
right and left one, and in here have a plexus collection of the electronic supply. It does have sympathetic fibers and parasympathetic fibers as well. Okay, so this is different from number three and number four. Number three and number four lateral home cells are the roots of the sympathetic efferent to the pelvis from lumbar spinal nerve. Okay, this one and that one. Okay, what about the afferent, which is very important for you? Very, very important. Why? Because it carries sensory innervation, sensory pain, I mean pain, sensory from the organs all the way to the to the center of the body, to the seeingness. So important for you to know about the afferent. So I told you that we have sympathetic supply everywhere in the body, but afferent, not every organ, not everything in the body will well transmit pain through sympathetic pathway. And the pelvis only ovary, tube, uterus, and just the pontus of the uterus and the body of the uterus. Those are the parts that will transmit pain through the sympathetic pathway back to the CNS. Okay. And you know, we can understand that they will go all the way back to L3 and L4, the origin. Yes, that's correct. But also they there will be some anastomosis here and the pain will rise all the way up to the T10. So it takes afferent from the uterus tubes to the hypogastric plexus, the inferior, superior hypogastric plexus, all the way to L3, L2, L3, L4. Then the pain will rise all the way up to T10. This is why pain from the labor, labor pain, the woman will feel pain all the way to level of T10, umbilicus, all the way to the level of T10, the umbilicus. Important for you to understand this. This clear, guys. Okay? Everything in the peritoneum that covered, everything in the pelvis that covered in peritoneum, sensory afferent via sympathetic pathway. So, part of the bladder, ovary, uterus, except lower trans segment and the cervix, the tubes. If there is pain, if there's inflammation, if there is pain in the part of this, the pain will be transmitted to the CNS via the hypogastric plexus, sympathetic pathway, L3, L4, all the way up to level of T10. Okay? I'll be referred pain, referred pain to level around the umbilicus. So this is why these the spinal anesthesia and epidural anesthesia are very effective in blocking, very effective in blocking labor pain because they block the spinal sensation to the level of T10. Clear guys or not? It's clear guys. I know it's a little bit tricky, but very important for you to clear this concept. Do you know, do you know why Labor pain now has referred pain to T10. It's just clear. Please. Repeat again. Okay. I have a best idea for you. So we have uterus here. Okay, tubes, ovary. Okay, so we need to supply, and we have the rest of the purpose. Have the bladder, you have the anal canal, rectum, other things. Okay, so we need supply uh, 
nerve supply, sympathetic supply to supply these organs for the motility, for secretion of things, for you know the physiology of you know these organs. Okay, that's correct. So uh, fibers from number three and number four. Okay, we descend down there. Okay, to form plexus here. This is the superior hypogastric plexus. Well. Uh, divides into inferior hypogastric plexus, right one, left one, and this inferior hypogastric plexus will give sympathetic supply everywhere in the body, everywhere in the pelvis. Okay, this is for the afferent. Sorry, for the efferent. What about the afferent? Afferent, the pain sensation. If there's pain, if there's inflammation here or here or here, okay. So. Fibers from the uterus, tubes, ovary, and everything that's covered by the peritoneum will transmit pain through sympathetic pathway. So the reverse of this pathway, inferior plexus, superior hypogastric plexus, all the way to L3 and L4, but not just right there. Fibers will also, you know, uh, will travel above L3, L4, all the way to T10. So pain pass all the way to T10 through, uh, through the sympathetic pathway. If this clean out of the Hassan. So T10 is a very important marker for you here because this is the level of blocking of epidural anesthesia, okay? Okay. Okay, had it not been like this, okay, epidural anesthesia would have been of no benefit at all, okay? So this is a sympathetic pathway. So uh, the last line is important because this one you need to remember in the exam. Everything that covered by peritoneum, sensory pathway will pass Covered by protein means the tube, ovary, uterus, and body of the uterus. Transmits pain, inferior plexus, superior plexus to the spinal cord, all the way to level of T10. Okay, what about the parasympathetic pathway? Efferent, again, an afferent. So, the main parasympathetic pathway in the pelvis is S2, S3, and S4. This is the center of the parasympathetic plexus, okay? So S2, S3, and S4, this red or blue one right here, okay? So fibers pass here all the way to the inferior hypogastric plexus. So as I told you, inferior hypogastric plexus is a station, a major hub for all the autonomic supply of the pelvis, okay? It does have, it, it, it has sympathetic supply and parasympathetic supply. So parasympathetic fibers from S2, 3, and 4, okay? These fibers from here, okay, will go everywhere in the pelvis to supply the ovary, the tube, as an efferent, okay? Focus as an efferent. I told you a couple of minutes ago that every inch, every one millimeter in the body, has different sympathetic and parasympathetic pathway. Okay, what about the pain? These fibers also transmit pain. These fibers also transmit pain from everything that's not covered by the peritoneum, from lower trans segment, from the cervix, from the vagina, and from the base of the bladder. Okay, so these fibers here will take pain from from the foot surface, for example, to S2, S3, and S4, back to the spinal cord. Okay, there is no, they wouldn't go, wouldn't drop up anywhere further. They wouldn't drop up anywhere further. Okay, Dr. Hassan, okay, Dr. Samia. Okay, 
Okay, this is why you're not allowed to do, you're not allowed to do, uh, you're not allowed to do cervical dilatation with that anesthesia. Otherwise, it'll be, you know, it will be so much pain here. We transmit it through parasympathetic pathway to the center of the body, and it will be parasympathetic, you know, overflow. The patient will suffer from bradycardia and other things, yeah, hypertension. So you shouldn't do any painful procedure on the cervix without an anesthesia, proper anesthesia. Somatic pathway. Somatic pathway, efferent and afferent. So somatic means con voluntarily controlled by our will. Okay, so we have efferent and afferent. Again, efferent to the pit of the nerve, S2, 3, and 4. Yes, yes, yes. Same roots of the parasympathetic part, but this time, these roots will give us the uh, pit of the nerve. This yellow one right there. These roots give us this time the pit of the nerve. S2, 3, and 4. So S2, 3, and 4 give the uh, parasympathetic roots to the inferior hypogastric plexus and also as well as the somatic pit of the nerve. The pit of the nerve is the main supply of skeletal muscles of the pelvis, supply the veto in eye, coccygeus, the sphincters, everything. Also, the main supply of the perineum as well, the pit of the nerve. Okay. And apparent cutaneous sensation of the perineal skin, lower one third of the vagina. The pain that we feel from the skin and cutaneous. Uh, sensation, sensory. Okay, guys, is this clear? So now we're done with the nerve supply, of the somatic sensation of the pelvis, and as well as the autonomic sensation of the pelvis. How do you feel now, guys? Okay, good. So the ovary is a little bit different because the blood supply and the anatomy and embryology of the, of the ovary is a little bit different from, from the other, from the other uh, structures, okay? So sympathetic, you know, again, we need sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation to the ovary. Sympathetic, from the lesser splanchnic nerve. You know, where is the lesser splanchnic nerve? We have the greater splanchnic nerve, lesser splanchnic nerve, least splanchnic nerve, and lumbar splanchnic nerve, and pelvic splanchnic nerve. So many splanchnic nerves in the body. So lesser splanchnic nerve is yes, it has some, yeah, sure, for sure. Okay. So from the lesser splanchnic nerve, uh, lesser splanchnic nerves, the 11 and 10, 10 and 11, 10 and 11, okay? Post-ganglionic fibers pass to the gonadal arteries. Can you see this gonadal arteries? Okay. So sympathetic fibers, okay, I'll zoom in here for you, just a minute. I need to zoom, 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 please. Yeah, right there. So this is our, this is the renal arteries, as you can see, renal artery, right one, left one. This is the, something called the aorta renal ganglia, this one. So fibers from here, this is the lesser, lesser splanchnic artery, and this is the least splanchnic nerve, I mean. So this is the lesser, and this is the, the least one. So this is from uh, C, T10 and T11 to the aorta ganglia fibers from here, postganglionic fibers pass along with the ovarian artery all the way down to the ovary. Okay.
Good. So, I'm passing the fibers from these blank and from the purpose blank and it's S2, 3, and 4. Okay. So, sensory innovation will be a sympathetic pathway, a water gain ganglia, less respinaceous nerve, T10 and T11. So, referred pain. So, this is why the referred pain in the ovary is around the umbilicus. Important, it's not around the ovary, it's not iliac pain. Referred pain in the ovary. Okay, as long as it does not affect the obturator nerve, I mean, just in the ovary itself. Any pain in the ovary itself, the pain will be referred around the area of the umbilicus because of the uh, referred pain to the lesser splanchnic nerve T10, T11, which is the dermatomes around the umbilicus. Is this correct, guys? Okay, is this clear? So this is a map of the referred pain, important for you. So ovary T10 and T11. So here, T10 T11, around the umbilicus, ovary, lateral splanchnic nerve, T10 T11. Hey, can you see this, you know, those two areas in the brown, okay? This is the ovary, okay? Referred pain of the ureter, T11 and L2. T11 and L2. Where's L2? This is L2 in the thigh. So there's a mnemonic for that. It's called line and grind. So line and grind. This is the referred pain of the, of the ureter. So when you take history of the patient, the patient described pain in the side of the body all the way down to the inner side of the thigh. Line and grind. Ureter, right there, this one right there this is the referred pain of the ureter because the supply of the ureter comes from this part t11 all the way down to l2 okay this is the map of referred pain so the pain in the ovary appears around uh, appears around the particles okay c10 t11 let's respond to it okay Okay, so next. So I'm going to skip these slides because it just I need you to memorize uh, not everything, just the nerve roots. Okay, so iliohypogastric nerve. So all of these nerves are somatic nerves, guys. Okay, those are not in the total of nerves. Those are somatic nerves. Gives they give uh, motor supply to the muscles and transmits somatic sensation of the continuous supply of the, of the abdomen and the thigh, okay? So you have iliohypogastric nerve, T12, L1. Iliunguinal nerve, T12, L1, okay? Genitofemoral nerve, important, L1, L2. Genitofemoral nerve, L1, L2. Lastrocutaneous nerve, the thigh, L2, L4. Femoral nerve, the very big one, L1, L2, L3, and L4. Four roots for the femoral nerve. This green one here. Okay, L1, L2, L3, L4, obturator nerve, L2, all the way to L4. Obturator nerve, L2, 3, and 4. So you can say, you can think of obturator nerve as a sister to the pedendal nerve. So pedendal nerve, S2, S3, S4. Obturator nerve, L2, L3, L, L4. So like its cousin from the lumbar plexus okay so i just need to make sure about the femoral nerve because i i do recall that femoral nerve the roots are l2 3 and 4 you know there's much debate in this point so i'm asking you to wait until i finish the lecture today as i'll double check about the femoral nerve roots uh is l1 included or not but definitely two, three, and four are there, okay? I'm not sure about femoral nerve, L1 is included, not, 
might be a mistake, might not. So please wait until I finish and I'll double check it. Okay. Okay, good. And this is the sacral plexus. Sorry. Sacral plexus. Sacral plexus, we have so many nerves as well. We have superior gluteal nerve, inferior gluteal nerve, uh, posterior vitreous nerve, the size, sciatic nerve, pedonal nerve. The most two important nerves in this lecture and this sacral plexus would be sciatic nerve and the pedonal nerve. Sciatic nerve, the largest nerve of the body roots from l4 all the way to s3 so we have l4 l5 s1 2 and 3 so for well, as soon as it you know as soon as it comes out of the spinal cord it divides into two main nerves the common peroneal nerve l4 l5 s1 s2 and tibial nerve l4 so tibial nerve by the way you know is formed from all the nerve of the static nerve L4, L5, S1, 2, and 3. And common peroneal nerve from L4 all the way down to S2. Okay? This is difficult. This is tough, I know. You know, I don't, I don't record this much. I have to, you know, revise it before the lecture. Otherwise, I won't be able to remember anything at all. Okay? So, the, the the most important or the most important will be the pedonal nerve s2 3 and 4 okay unit of femoral nerve important why important so it comes out of the lumbar plexus it's l1 l2 past superficial to the this is the psoas muscle this one this is the iliacus this is the psoas, this is the iliopsoas muscle, and it passes just lateral to this, the external iliac artery. Those are the external iliac lymph node groups. Okay, so it, two branches. So it passes through the inguinal canal from the middle, and it, you know, one branch will leave the canal in the middle. This one, this is the femoral branch, and the genital branch will continue all the way down to the external ring, the superficial ring, okay? During surgery, you know, during removal of those lymph nodes, we might inadvertently, okay, cut this nerve. And the patient will complain of some numbness paralysia in the anterior part of the thigh, okay? So you need to take great, great, take great care when you do left connection with the external group of the lymph nodes. Okay, that's clear, guys. Okay. Good. Question. 36-year-old woman underwent total abdominal hysterectomy for uterine fibroids. Post-operatively, she complains of loss of flexion of her left hip. Okay, she 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 she's not able to, you know, do flexion of her left hip, numbness of the left anterior medial part of the thigh, the compression of which nerve is likely to be responsible. Which nerve is responsible for this kind of injury? So she was going total abdominal hysterectomy. She was there for quite long. So. So loss of flexion of the left hip, numbness of the left and anterior medial part of the thigh. Anterior, yeah, obturative nerve. This is the clencher, you guys. So obturative nerve is also responsible for uh, nerve supply and nerve supply to the muscles of the anterior compartment of the thigh and also the innervation, sensory innervation of the skin of the anterior and medial part of the thigh. So towards the medial part of the thigh, obturator nerve, obturator nerve. Good. 
the 19 year old uh, extremely anxious lady requests labor epidural analgesia. Okay, during epidural placement, C settles are chained in the needle catheter, which, you know, uh, which one's spinal cord goes the needle transverse, obtaining C leakage from the needle catheter? You know, basically, this question is asking about what is the space that we inject through the dose of the spinal anesthesia or epi, uh, sorry, sorry, epidural anesthesia. So epidural, this is the anatomy of the epidural anesthesia, which is space that where we inject the epidural catheter, which is space. Oh, guys, uh, need to answer, please. Okay, no time for this. Okay, that would be B, space between wall of the vertebral canal and dura mater. I'll show you what I mean in a minute. Just be with me. One of the one one of the extremely important questions for part one and part two. This question is recall question in part two. You know, maybe every year this question comes in the exam, appears in the exam. Also for part one, baby's birth was complicated with shoulder dystocia and subsequently diagnosed with herbs palsy. What is herbs palsy? Which roots should be injured? Yes, Dr. Hassan. So could you please answer this question? Forget about the, the spinal anesthesia because I'll explain that slide in a minute. I'll do the nerve injuries, then we'll take a break. So B, B or D, B. B. Dr. Samia, you're correct. Dr. Hassan is C5 and C6. Okay, so another question. 65 year old lady underwent vaginal surgery for which she was in life lipotomy position. This is the clencher for two and a half hours. Post operatively, okay. You have notice properties of the lateral side of the leg. Food drop, food drop. You know, you don't need to, you know, finish the question. The compression of which nerve is likely to be responsible? A comprenial nerve, yeah, straight ahead. Straightforward question. So nerve injuries, we will do the nerve injuries and, and then we'll take a break, okay? So, Nerve ranges are going to cause you the many pathology for nerve ranges like direct compression, blood cut, entrapment, incorrect placement of the trockers, edema, compression of hematoma transaction. Okay, incorrect position of the patient. This is what you need to take care of. Okay, so first, a brachial plexus injury. Brachial plexus, you don't need to know everything. Okay, you just need to know that we have C5, C6. C7, C8, and C1. C7 has nothing to do with us. So we're dealing with the upper two roots and lower two roots. Upper two roots, C5 and C6. Those are responsible for herbs palsy. C8 and T1, those are responsible for Crumpkey's palsy. So we have upper two, lower two. Forget about C7, no C7. C5, C6, C8, T1, okay? 
So hyper abduction of the arms, like in this one. So the arms is more than 90 degrees to the body, like this, or during labor, for example, okay, this is an adult during labor, in shoulder dissociation, you know, in you know, incorrect uh, axial traction of the head will uh will elicit injury on C5 and C6, the upper two roots will lead to the uh hyper of the uh air possible this one okay internal rotation and this video as you can see on the other one okay compression of the lower roots like c8 and t1 lead to clumpy's palsy which is you know uh disorder of the internal intrinsic muscle of the hand will lead to close hand close hand like in this one so clumpy's close hand and herbs waiter step hand this picture is very important this is the table from the college table from the talk article of the college discussing the different uh so many of particular break versus injury so all you need to do is you know memorize the other nerve injury the herbs i mean herbs injury and clumpies c5 and c6 lead to waiter step clumpy c8 and t1 close hand and clumpies by the way is important in the adults okay because actually it comes uh, as a result of this you know trend of position with shoulder braces you know being you know too tight in the root of the neck yeah so there'll be so much compression in the root of the neck right here root of the neck especially in the lower roots c8 and c1 okay so we need to make sure this does not happen okay guys Okay, so burps, way to step, C5, C6, plumb keys, C8, T1, close hands. Good. For the rest of the flight position, we have so many nerves coming, you know, in significant relation to the light thought position, like femoral artery, obturator artery, sciatic nerve, common perineal nerve, tibial nerve, lateral cutaneous nerve. Okay, let me just explain here because this is important. I need a pen. Yeah. So, sciatic nerve posteriorly divides into common perineal nerve and tibial nerve. Can you see this part? So, compression from these staples on the common perineal nerve. This will lead to foot drop and, uh, you, know, you know, sensation anomalies on the lateral part of the thigh of the leg. I mean. So leg problems and foot problems, okay, from the common perineal nerve. Also here comes out from here, the femoral nerve. So, so much, too much time kinking with the nerve uh, might lead to femoral nerve injuries, femoral nerve injuries, but this is not common by the way in left platform position. The one that's really common in left platform position would be the obturator nerve. Obturator nerve response comes here, medial side of the thigh, responsible of nerve supply to the uh, muscles of the anterior and medial part of the thigh. Okay. So, light total position mainly obturator nerve, sciatic nerve, common perineal nerve. Okay. Sometimes the femoral, but especially the obturator nerve. Obturator nerve. So, yeah, other causes of lumbosacral injury. So we know that lumbosacral plexus uh, gives rise to the femoral, sciatic, and other kind of uh, nerves. So deeply seated retractors, I'll show you what I mean in a minute, will lead to injury of the femoral nerve. The lady will come up with the surgery uh, complaining of inability to climb the stairs, femoral nerve. Femoral nerve is the main nerve supply of the hip flexors and knee extensors. 
okay? So injury to this nerve, the lady won't be able to flex the hip, won't be able to climb the stairs, okay? Transubterator tape operation, obturator nerve, I'll show it to me in a minute. Sacrospinous fixation, good on the nerve. External iliac, uh, this should be, sorry, lymphadenectomy. I need to, uh, this is page 77, okay. External iliac lymphadenectomy, uh, uh, we had that a couple of minutes ago. We'll injure the genital femoral nerve, L1, L2, okay. Nerve entrapment during cesarean section, this one. Iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal nerve entrapment. When you cut through this one, okay, during finishing incision and uh, during uh, cesarean section, okay, you'll cut through the nerve and the nerve. So you need to be, you know, sensible in the length of your incision. You don't have to go that far, okay? You can, you can just be in the middle right here. You'll be good with that. Okay, as long as you don't see the fibers of the external of the muscles, you'll be okay. Okay, so mainly finish sheet incision should be within the aponeurosis, within the fascia, within the sheath. Don't go to the muscles. If you, if you go to the muscles, you will cut the ilianguinal ilihypocostic nerve. Okay. If you see the muscles, if you cut through the muscles, you need to avoid dual nerve entrapment. Nerve entrapment means you take stitches and compress the nerve. You take the nerve in the stitch itself. So in order to avoid this, take or stitch every layer apart. So you first close the internal oblique, then call the transverse abdominus, then close the external oblique. Okay, in that manner, you want do nerve entrapment, you want entrap the nerve. So nerve entrapment means you take a stitch over the nerve. Okay, don't do this. So there's a common triad. This is basically part two, uh, you know, point. The iliohypogastric ilioinguinal Entrapment to try it of sharp burning pain radiating from incision site to the non previous labia and thigh. Okay, this is the course of the ilium glenoidal pathway. It'll be biopsy over the nerve distribution area as well and pain relieves following analgesics. Try to this sharp pain in pain to the non previous labia, biopsy over the nerve distribution area pain to leave following analgesics, okay? I told you about this uh, ilio, uh, genital femoral nerve, L1 or 2 injury during external iliac lymphadenectomy. Femoral nerve injury is very common, especially after abdominal hysterectomy, okay? Why? Because the deeply seated retractors, deeply seated retractors. What does it mean? And I told you the patient will come complaining of inability to climb the stairs, weakness of the hip flexors and abductors. Okay, so where's the femoral nerve here? Okay, it's entrapped between the substance of the source muscle. If you put, can you see this retractor? You know, and here the femoral nerve is you know, kinked. So if you put the retractors deep down in the pelvis, right there, you might do some kinking to the femoral nerve if you, if you don't pay much attention during surgery. This is very important for you not to use deeply seated retractors, okay? And also you can you know, consider using some pads and non self carrying retractors in order to you know, avoid nerve injuries, okay? Hey guys, are you happy till now? So I think femoral nerve L2, 3 and 4, not L1 is not included. 
So, but I told you I'll, I'll double check that in a minute. Okay, so optic nerve injury. This is this happens during the TOT uh, operation with the transobturator tape. You know, the surgeon pass a tape through the obturator uh, foramen and deliver it through the vagina. This is in order to one of the suspension of the urethra and the bladder in order to uh, one of the surgical uh, management of the stress urinary incontinence. So we deliver the needle through the obturator canal foramen. What structures pass through the obturator canal? These are the obturator nerve, obturator artery. So inadvertently, you might injure the artery and nerve. So you need to take great attention, okay? You need to know what are you doing properly in order to avoid uh, uh, injuring the nerve and artery passing through the obturator canal, okay? Obturator nerve lead actually to minor disabilities because uh, we have two nerve supply to the anterior compartment of the, uh, the thigh, the femoral nerve, which is the main nerve supply, and the obturator nerve, which is an accessory supply, okay? So obturator nerve injury will lead to minor disabilities, but will lead also to paralysis of the medial side of the thigh. So this will be your clincher, clincher in the, in the exam, okay? Paralysis over the medial side of the thigh. So this is summary of the lumbar sacral nerve injuries. So every nerve origin, the function and the clinical presentation, as you can see, femoral nerve, where's my laser pointer? Femoral nerve. So guys, it's L2, 3 and L4. Now I'm pretty sure of it. The first slide was a mistake. You know, it's not a mistake. There's so much debate about it, but you know, according to the college opinion, femoral nerve, L2, 3, and L4. So we have two nerves of the same roots, obturator nerve, femoral nerve, L2, 3, L4, and their cousin, the obturator, the bedundum nerve, S2, S3, and S4, okay? This picture, this table, is the most important table in the nerve injury, along with the, the one with the brachial plexus. So if you need to skip all these, you know, fuss about nerve injuries, you study those tables, this table and the first table of the brachial nerve injury, okay? Okay, guys, so lamp supply. I think I'm tired and need to pray. So we take a break, maybe 15 minutes. How about that? Okay. We still have like 100 slides to go. Yeah, it's pretty lengthy lecture today. Okay, so we need two more hours to cover everything, inshallah. Break for 20 minutes. Twenty minutes. Okay. Thank you. See you in twenty minutes. Thank you.